and this is for the council meeting number six for January 2-4, 2023. I'd like to call this meeting to order and we recognize that we meet on the traditional territory of the Lataco Dene Nation. Uh, we do have some changes to the agenda and I'll quickly go over that. Item J1 is a report that uh, was coming from me and I'm standing it down and when we get to that particular uh, spot on the agenda, I'll explain why that item is being stand stood down. Uh, under N4 and N5, we have two bylaws that have been circulated and they are official community plan bylaw number 1933 and zoning bylaw number 1934. Uh, also, there is a, a small a, a, a amendment to the regular minutes of the last meeting, so uh, uh, Ria, if you could just clarify what the uh, small amendment would be. Under attendance, I omitted Lindsay Blair. And um, we also have, um, no, I don't have any other, no other changes, right, Ria? That, yeah, okay. So I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Uh, Councillor Runge, Councillor Vick, any discussion? All in favor, opposed, carried. Okay, so now we will go to adoption of the, oh, we're gonna adopt the minutes then as, as amended. So I would ask for a motion, Councillor McKelvey, Councillor uh, Tony Goulet, any discussion? All in favor, opposed, carried. Uh, we do not have any presentations. We have a delegation. And after a long absence, I'm absolutely delighted to, uh, to introduce our MLA, Coralie Oaks, uh, to come up to the microphone and um, give us the latest, Coralie. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, councillors, directors, staff. Uh, it is truly a delight to be with you all this evening. Um, I do want to recognize that we're on Lataco First Nations uh, with respect. And uh, it is an opportunity for us. Um, we have the new parliamentary calendar that is out uh, for the provincial government this year. We head back to the legislature uh, in two weeks. And this year, our parliamentary calendar looks a little bit different. And I thought it would be an opportunity for uh, me to go over for the calendar a little bit and look at ways that we can coordinate and work collaboratively together. Uh, this year we are finishing uh, this session in May, so it's a month short. We have a uh, one month less than what we normally uh, have in Victoria, but it means that we don't have the traditional constituent weeks. And the challenge, of course, that we have, that is always our opportunity to come into the community and uh, between Victoria and, and connect with individuals. So I I thought um, I would take this opportunity uh, to first congratulate everyone and to say I look forward very much to uh, continue to work uh, with each of you and with staff. Um, I really appreciate that opportunity and I, I, I sort of broke it down into where I, um, where I see the spring going specifically around spring freshet and things that perhaps we could coordinate and work collaboratively on. The first, the Ministry of Transportation has advised us that it is going to to be a difficult uh, spring freshet. With the weather that we have been having, um, we should all start preparing for what uh, that will look like. Uh, as we all know, in the last few years, we have been um, in several situations where almost every road uh, into uh, the city of Quenelle has been um, at threat of being compromised. We've had struggles with uh, several sections of Highway 97, which are very problematic. Of course, we have bridge challenges, and all of this impacts both people coming into the community and the corridors. So if we can make sure that we um, keep the communication lines open, and as I hear information, I'll make sure I, I pass that on and, and vice versa. Um, 
we do need to coordinate to the work that needs to happen around bridges. And uh, we have a lot of transportation network in, uh, in and around the city of Cornell, and I know firsthand from having sat uh, where you're sitting, the challenges it is for local governments to be managing the bridges. Um, it is a significant cost, it's a significant challenge. Um, of particular note, uh, the uh, Johnson Street Bridge, and I think I look forward to having that opportunity to have a discussion with you around Johnson Street Bridge and perhaps uh, ways that I can help advocate on behalf of the municipality of the challenges it is with that bridge. Um, we all know that when you look at Maple Drive, um, with industrial traffic not being able to utilize Johnson Street Bridge, the challenge and the pressure it puts on Maple Drive, and specifically from a public safety angle, um, with having you know 500, uh, 550 children that are at the middle school, the daycare, the elementary school, and of course all of the industrial traffic that has to go on Maple Drive now. Um, to access uh, the major industry of Wellwood. I really would look forward to the opportunity for us to sit down and talk about that. Perhaps um, at the Union of BC Municipalities, there may be some work that we could do together um, to uh, share uh, with the minister the challenges um, of that and, and look towards solutions. Uh, the other one around um, when we look at transportation, I would welcome the opportunity to sit down and talk about the airport. It is critical for us to have uh, the airport open in uh, the city of Quinnell and the partnership with Central Mountain Air we very much appreciate. Uh, we need to protect those services and perhaps there's an opportunity for us to have ongoing dialogue on, on what that looks like. Um, it is a challenge uh, to um, for some of the regular flyers flying in and out of the community. Um, I want to acknowledge the exceptional work of the employees at the airport as well as the work at Central Mountain Air. It is a very difficult job um, with the changes and the challenges um, that happened with air travel and I think we should be acknowledging our local uh, people that are, are working out there. Um, we all know with inflationary challenges that we're certainly starting to see those stressors in our community and I predict as we head into the spring we're going to continue to see that increase. Uh, more and more in our office we're seeing uh, specifically around seniors, the challenges that they are facing and I look forward to working with uh, uh, City Council on ways of course to move uh, forward the Northern Health proposed residential acute care uh, assisted living facility. I think that's incredible incredibly important uh, for um, our community and I look forward to continuing with that conversation to advocate through Northern Health for that very important facility as well as working with Northern Health on healthcare uh, in general and how we can support all of our healthcare professionals that are really struggling right now. And um, you know, we have some suggestions, uh, some solutions that we've been advocating for and, and a lot of that comes from training. We're very grateful to have the North Caribou Community Campus in the community. And I know firsthand, um, as probably many people who've had loved ones that may have been in our healthcare system recently, how grateful we are that there are so many of the healthcare professionals that have come out of our North Caribou Community Campus. And there's a real opportunity for us to expand on training, whether that's uh, the LPN program, care aids. Uh, there's a huge opportunity for us to see growth in that, and I look forward to advocating uh, with the community for an increased amount of training, training dollars um, and supports in our community. I know the prolific offenders has been a significant challenge in our community and I think that there's again, um, you know, I appreciate the fact that uh, the, go um, the government is looking at opportunities for a prolific offender program where um, similar to work that has been done in the past where it provides community better opportunities to have um, to have a say or to be able to to look at communities' wishes and I think that's critically important. Uh, we all know the challenges with mental health and addiction um, in our communities and again advocating in our community for increased supports I think is critically important. Um, housing 
of course, is a problem right across uh, the province. But I think we have a real opportunity to look at student housing. And um, I'm going to channel Mary Glassford for a moment. Uh, for anyone that remembers the days when we were all advocating for the North Caribou Community Campus, and that was the first big Mary Glassford rally of getting the community together. And then her phase two was the trades training facility, and we were successful that. Well, her third vision was really to have housing, student housing on campus. And I think we are at a critical opportunity um, for our community community to advocate for that. It aligns with uh, the provincial government's housing um, priorities uh, and it aligns with uh, some of the work that is being done um, both, you know, through the college and, and the UNBC. So I think that there's there's a real potential there to fulfill uh, that, third, that third vision of Mary Glassford and to see student housing uh, in our community and that of course would help with the training pieces. Right now at UBC there's 800 people on a waiting list for the nursing program uh, down in the lower mainland. There's a real opportunity for us to be attracting a lot of professional uh, students to come into our community, but the one piece that we don't have is the housing. And so I think that is a, a very plausible win that we could all uh, work to, uh, and coordinate together. Finally, shop local. Uh, I really appreciate all of the work that's been done by um, an amazing community. We always need to remember the importance of investing and shopping local and where that money goes, whether it's our hockey teams, our soccer teams, we need to invest and shop local. Uh, truth and reconciliation, of course, is something that we all are um, need to be working towards, and I want to applaud the city for the works that they are doing on, on reconciliation. Um, I appreciate that. Um, maybe just finally in closing, I hear it's a birthday of somebody that I've had the opportunity to work with for many years. So, Tanya, happy birthday. Um, you know, I, I think, not to embarrass you, but, you know, one of the things when we talk about education and the importance of education is when we look at, uh, we all fought to make sure that uh, we had the University of Northern British Columbia and the impact it has had on uh, all of our communities. I can't say enough about how important it was to have, and it is, to have that university. And when you have graduates that come out of that and have played such a pivotal role in our communities, I think we should applaud that. And I was meeting uh, last week at the Natural Resource Conference with uh, UMBC, the planning and sustainability. I was meeting with the, uh, the chair and the student president talking about how important that planning and sustainability program is for our local governments and to make sure that we encourage that and they were looking for graduates of that and the work that they've done in our communities and of course I talked about uh, the incredible work that Tanya's done for many years as the director of uh, development services so uh, congratulations on that um, but I do really think that there's an opportunity uh, to um, advocate to the government about investing and continuing that investment in the sustainability and planning department through UMBC. Several years ago with the growth of LNG, we had a partnership where we invested in making sure that interns were put in all of the small communities for planning, and I thought it was a huge win. So having that program at, you know, in the north when a lot of local governments are challenging, are being challenged with capacity, having a university of that caliber uh, is an opportunity for us to utilize so I'll look at ways to to put that and I also had the opportunity to talk to the university about the incredible challenges we have when it looks at land use and planning with the challenges of our roads that when you have a community such as Quinell where every arterial road in and out of the community is is being challenged that is a very special project I think that the university should be looking at uh, working on so hopefully that will move forward um, but with that maybe I'll open it up for some questions because I probably took more than my time but it was just a delight to be here. Okay, thank you, Corley. Before I do open it up for questions, I just want to say that we have another birthday in the house, and that's Councillor McKelvey. So I think it's time we ordered up some cake. Could we have some cake brought in? I think it would be appropriate. Uh, so now the floor is open for questions from, from council members or comments. Uh, Councillor Runge. 
you to go first, but hey, that cake's a budget item. Um, Corley, thank you for being here. I really do appreciate all those, uh, you know, the points you hit on, Johnson Bridge, Maple Drive, if there's another way for us to find a way to fund it and still support industry, I think it's, uh, and everybody around town and the whole town, I think it's really, really important. You know, the uh, for the airport, finding a, a schedule that actually works for us so that we can actually take off sometime in the morning, come back possibly that day or come back early so you don't have to make it a weekend would be absolutely wonderful. So if there's any strings you can pull out YVR for them to land or something like that, that'd be really, really, you know, for me it'd be fabulous because I often have to travel out just to make my time schedules for other meetings. Um, with regards to seniors' uh, support uh, in the training and the healthcare and the seniors' uh, center, that's I, I just hope we can pull some strings and you know because that's that would be absolutely absolutely wonderful for Cornell. Um, I'll leave the other portions there with regards to Highway 97 or the different towns and um, just a heads up, you know, because I believe that we uh, I don't know who we talk to when we're dealing with uh, you know highway routes, Modi routes, and stuff like that because you know if you're driving up to Prince George, pretty close to our town. You know, we have a bump that's getting bigger every day, and I'd hate to see that slip in with no, uh, with no uh, chance to actually have it repaired really, really, qu really quickly. And the same, I guess, goes for south of town. Uh, and this would be in the regional district when you're hitting, I guess, uh, by the farm there. You know, right by, by Diamond View, I think it is, uh, where where that where that slippage seems come. You know, the cliff comes closer and closer to the highway. And for me, it's always like, hey, that's okay. This is this is fairly natural around here. But as long as we have a plan to get around it into the future, you know, that it doesn't come to come hit us and all of a sudden we're left with a, you know, three-year plan to figure things out because it's such a vital artery. So thank you very much. Thanks for being here to support us. I mean, it's really, it is important. And, uh, you know, I welcome our, our opportunity to work together with Council and you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Runge. Anyone else at this moment? Councillor Vick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Corley. I, <clears throat> Councilor Runge covered off a lot of the, the broad comments. I just, um, one, one area where we, we seem to be losing a little traction is with our interconnector. And I guess I, I would ask you, what, what can, where do you see us working with you to try and get some ministerial traction with that project? It's, um, it's extremely important that bridge is, is uh, as you know, it's, it's in rough shape and we need to make a, we need to have something done on that front. So I'll throw that over to you. That's a really, both those are really good questions. Um, the area on Highway 97, they've changed the name of the, the trouble spot on Highway 97. They're calling it the Kusan. It was Chen Hill. So now the ministry has changed that to Kusan. I think that that's probably going to be one of the uh, areas even worse than what is called the Cottonwood. That's the, the, the two areas on Highway 97 that they're watching and they're monitoring. Um, they're, they are very concerned about uh, Kusan. Uh, it is getting very close uh, to the highway. And as we all know, um, the impacts of Highway 97 closing, and I remind them, and every opportunity that each of you have, um, I highly encourage any opportunity you have to talk with any of the ministry staff, is if Highway 97 goes, we don't have the backups because the backup used to be the old Prince George Highway. And while they're doing work on that, that currently doesn't exist. And the other backup, is going out on Bushy Lake. So right now what the Ministry of Transportation perceives as their backup for Highway 97 is to go out to, um, uh, it comes out at Baldy Hughes. So you're Pelican Lake, but then you're going across Knickerbocker. And Knickerbocker, if anyone who's been driving out to Bushy Lake recently, of course, is very problematic. And the backup to Bushy Lake is going up to Pinnacles, and that road is threatened as well. So when they start looking at backup roads to keep um, the highway network uh, intact, we are compromised at almost every avenue. So um, again, any opportunity you have to raise that is critically important. Um, Councillor Vic, to your point around the interconnector, I think what is really important from having spent so much time on the road conversation is we desperately need assistance or help with planning a transportation network of what that looks like because I feel what is happening right now from a from a ministry of transportation is that 
we don't have a comprehensive transportation plan to see how when you have all of the, the Highway 97 and then you've got all the side roads, but then you have the interconnector and the importance of that. And again, the challenge becomes is the ministry is looking at each of those, uh, instead of looking at preventative work, um, it's always reactionary, and that's the, that's the nature of the Ministry of Transportation. We've had this conversation many, many times, and we need to get away from that because, you know, as I reminded folks that I was in Victoria two weeks before um, we had the ch challenges we had on West Fraser Road. Two weeks, we knew that the Nechaco water, or the, the Nasco uh, watershed was backing up. We knew that, and we said, could you get some preventative work into those areas? and of course they'll respond once an issue happens and it was hundred and four million dollars later like we can't continue to have that approach um, one only needs to travel across the bridge tonight to understand exactly what's happening on Highway 97, um, you know, the, the, the bridge over the Quenelle River, um, it's bad. And so what will it take? We don't have a backup. And so how can we start talking about maybe a plan? And that's why, you know, I was trying to reach out to the university or anybody that will take that um, so that we could go to government with an overall transportation strategy around what all of those pieces look like. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Rudenberg. Nice to see you, Coralie. <laughs> um, so, um, a couple of things, especially around the, the interconnector piece, because I know we have business uh, people asking that question, where are we at, what is going on there? And one of the comments they made is, so we have our MLA here, we need to touch base with MLAs on both sides of us. Because what affects us here, when we talk about 97 being that drive-through piece for goods and services, it affects the Williams Lake area, it affects the Prince George area. So when we talk about time to put a push on for how we try and get the funding for it, I think we need to include your colleagues in the conversation. Because because it affects their communities also. And I thought that was a really interesting point that was brought to the table. So I thought I would share that with you because it's just one of those pieces we know as a community, we like to see it happen for so many reasons, but there's opportunities to work with, you know, MLAs on both sides because it will affect them and their communities having something that flows through without concerns. <laughs> um, around the housing, totally get student housing, the need for it, but we have a need for many other levels of housing in this community and you saw you saw how the community um, ended up with a discussion when um, BC Housing wanted to take one of our hotels and turn it into um, a type of housing. So we know by the end of April, one of the, what you would call the COVID housing units will be closing because the funding is over. Approximately, it's for 20 persons. We know there's probably 40 plus persons living there. So we now know the homeless count that we had in 2020 was about 121 persons. We know that that number is going to increase. We also know that the community had a real concern about the style and the type of housing and where it was going to be placed. So how do we as a community work through knowing that we need to be able to provide housing for all of our community and make it so that it works for our entire community? And so it's about those conversations with BC Housing as far as I can see about how they change their models. Because when they say, but we've always done it this way, we've always put it down the, the downtown core. And my reply to that is, yes, you always do it that way and look at the pushback you're getting from the community, never mind from the council and the people who have to make the decisions, look at the pushback you're getting. And so it doesn't help anybody. And so we need to look at how BC Housing can change their modeling on how they create that whole system of housing because we know it starts from, from you know, um, facilities like Seasons House through bridges, through, there's that whole line of, uh, 
can't even think of the right word. We know that there's a continuum of housing that is needed, but we need to look at how they they do it in communities that makes it work for everyone. And I think that's a really important conversation to have because, like I said, you know, we had that 121 just, you know, sort of, you know, kind of pre-COVID, you know, or just when COVID was hitting. We know those numbers are going to be much higher. The probability are that they're going to be much higher this time because it's happening again this March, that homeless count. And so how do we take care of those people in the community without the rest of the community losing it because certain bureaucrats think it belongs in one place and we know it doesn't belong there. So I know that that's the kind of support that we look for from, from our higher levels of, of government uh, partners. Sure, I'll start with the housing and then I'll move maybe back up to transportation. On the housing side, um, I started with the student housing because I think that that is a real area of opportunity. And um, that's why I'm trying to put that on every agenda I possibly can because I see it as a real, uh, a real win for our communities in alignment where the province is. Look, the province is making significant changes to how BC housing um, functions and I encourage all of you to continue those conversations with me what works what doesn't and I'd be happy um, to raise it of course in opposition I don't you know I can certainly bring forward the concerns of the community and um, I want to thank uh, the council for the work that you did. You were put in a very um, difficult position. I think the other thing that all of us, all of us living in the community needs to be very aware is decisions with BC Housing also has to be taken in the context of how our support services are in health, right? That partnership has to be with Northern Health as well. Do we have the services in order to provide for people? If we do not have the services to provide for people in our community, then are we doing anyone any favors? So I think that's a real legitimate question that we should be asking, that when, as council, you're being asked um, to look at certain things, um, I maybe this is a good time to share this so through that process I did go to Northern Health and I asked what the capacity was in our community and what I was presented with is that it's the community who needs to come up with that information of what the capacity is that um, there they you know there's grants and there's different uh, processes to gather that information. Um, I believe we did that, um, I know I think we did that in around 2005 or 2006, perhaps it's something we look at again, if there is a grant that possibly we could look at so that we understand exactly what the services are in the community and the service groups providing that. Um, I think there's, there's an opportunity there so then we can actually go to Northern Health and say, look, we only have X amount of um, you know, healthcare professionals that could service um, these populations. I think it's an important one. Um, on the uh, conversation around uh, bringing in all of the communities around the interconnector, I would say that could be a really good opportunity for NCLGA uh, because UMBC did a study that when Highway 97 goes down, I think that there's only enough food uh, food starts getting impacted after three or five days. Um, I forget the exact amount. But so it's not just Prince George or Williams Lake. If Highway 97 goes down at any of those two areas, we start impacting all of the north. Um, and I get that there are other routes, you know, around, but it's certainly, um, we certainly saw that through the atmospheric river, any impact of Highway 97 has significant impacts on all of our communities. So, um, Council uh, Rudenberg, that might be a good one for us to work on um, uh, at NCLGA, and I'd be happy, you know, to, to work with you on that. And maybe just to NCLGA, and I saw that on a later agenda item that I'd also be more than willing to work on as a around the per diem around palliative care. 
uh, years ago, actually, I think I wrote um, the policy when I was in local government to put that forward. And I have personal experience myself having um, been in a situation where you sit down and you get the worst news you can possibly get that a loved one is going palliative. And then they start having that, they have to have that conversation that it's going to be, you know, X amount of dollars per day. And it's a really difficult time. And while it might be $1,300 a month, um, it's just it's just a layer of really bad pain at a time where people shouldn't, in our healthcare system, we shouldn't have, have that. And so please know um, I, whatever I can do on, on that particular policy, because I think it's, it's, a, it's a terrible policy and we should not have it. Sorry, I went off topic, but I, NCLJ tweaked it. Okay, uh, thank you, Coralie, and particularly the plug for the uh, the interconnector at NCLGA. I think that there is an opportunity there because certainly the Quinell interconnector is way, way more than just a Quinell issue. It is a provincial or at least a, a northern BC issue because um, Highway 97 uh, basically serves all of the north. And, um, and so that's important, and I think that we would have a captive audience at NCLGA. I'm not going to go through the, the extensive list that you covered. I think some of those high points have already been covered in, uh, in questions and comments from Council. But I do, I do want to take this opportunity to recognize that, uh, that you put the spotlight on assessment in your newspaper article, and that is very timely. Um, and I don't think that I'm the only one that has been getting calls, and I haven't had a lot, but it's funny how people see that and they immediately blame the city. So I have to basically straighten some people out on that one. And, uh, and your piece in the paper was, was very informative and, and valuable. So, so thank you for that. And I'm going to be looking for opportunities to, to bring you into the conversation on some of these other issues. Uh, we're going to be looking at, at more towards uh, bringing the public into not necessarily on the committees, but I can see in the future that we would have uh, some public forums on some of these issues and, and so keep your ear to the rail on that one. So no further questions from Council for Coralie. So on behalf of Council, Coralie, thank you and welcome back. May I just say that um, Dwayne Schultz is working in my office uh, part-time now. We're delighted to have him, and he wrote that article on the assessments, so that's great that he heard, and we appreciate, uh, we appreciate always uh, the work that's being done. So thank you very much, and all the best, and um, if anyone wants to set up a Zoom call while I'm in Victoria at any time, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Great, thank you again. Okay, moving along, we have no items arising from special closed meetings. We have no unfinished business. We do have committee's reports, one of them, and that is going to Councillor Vic for the January 11 Financial Sustainability and Audit Committee report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we had a recent meeting of FSAC on J January the 11th, and obviously uh, that's resulting in a major agenda item following this report, which is going to be our capital budget. Um, the committee discussed the updated version of the capital plan, and uh, it was uh, decided to bring the following. I guess what's relevant here is there's a few things that we're going to extract from the capital plan and bring it to strategic planning um, because of the broad ranging budget implications into the future that some of these topics have, such as the West Fraser Timber Park ball plan, um, the revitaliza revitalization plans, which would include Davy Street and North Fraser Landing um, and the BCR land discussion. So those will get due deliberation from Council in under the strategic lens before they get plugged into any uh, five-year plan. Um, so the capital budget we'll be talking about shortly. Uh, we moved on to the preliminary review of the operating budget. Um, we reviewed a first draft 
we discussed quite a few things. Uh, the Spirit Center and public washroom budget, we took a close look at that. We looked at the snow budget, which um, was reported out to the media recently that we were slightly over in our snow budget by about 130,000. Um, we have a reserve to cover that, but that reserve will need to be topped up, so that will become a budget implication this year. Um, we also have uh, the current operating level of the airport and a supplemental list for 2023 that are um, discussion items. The operating budget will return to our next uh, FSAC meeting for more review and deliberation. And also we have some results from our uh, recent uh, budget survey, so we look forward to discussing that feedback. And uh, we've also added as a permanent item to our action tracking list, which is something that compels a committee to go back to it again and again. Um, we've added the airport operation uh, operating discussion. Um, in terms of assessments, um, the committee reviewed the uh, assessments received in January. The average residential assessment has increased by 13.8%. And I've also added in there a comment about non-market change. So the non-market change, meaning not uh, due to assessment, was $7.6 million with residential accounting for $6.7 million, which is the new building um, uh, uh, new building inventory added to the community. Um, this is something we're keeping our eye on as we encourage development in the community in terms of uh, housing, um, uh, dense housing, apartments, things like that. We, we obviously want to see this number increase. Um, we moved on to the ministry stats. Uh, the committee reviewed uh, comparisons of the city's tax rates with other municipalities. In terms of uh, our position in the hierarchy, so uh, there's 162 jurisdictions that are identified, we made a few broad observations, and they're very broad. Um, the industrial rate class position has remained relatively static over the last few years. The business class position has risen and the residential class position has remained similar. Um, the committee discussed options for possible tax shifting and requested a small tax shifting option to be included in our next version of the operating budget to take a look at its implications. And we have uh, recommendations from FSAC will be covered in Director Bolton's report coming up next. And our next meeting is February 1st, 2023. Okay, thank you, Councillor Vic. Any questions or comments from Council at this point? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll now go to c council reports. And you'll note that um, my issue or my, my item on palliative care per diem has been uh, stood down. And the reason for that was that as I was preparing my resolution, I was having a case of deja vu and um, came to the realization that uh, actually I was involved in preparing and submitting a very similar resolution and and what this resolution will call for is for the for the government to level the playing field as it pertains to the charging of a per diem rate for people that are deemed palliative in a nutshell if someone is palliative in a hospital um, they do not pay the per diem if they're palliative in a hospice unit, such as what we have here, they pay a per diem and, and it's $43 a day. And that is a barrier to some, and it's not, frankly, it's not fair. Um, but as I said, as I got deeper into this, I realized that um, I was duplicating what was already, uh, what already happened way back in 2010. And uh, those that have been around a long time know that the UBCM, uh, doesn't really have an appetite for entertaining uh, repeat resolutions. So I'm back to the drawing board now to redesign and maybe disguise that resolution somewhat so that it doesn't appear to be exactly the same thing. So, so stay tuned on that. Any questions on that one? Th and thank you, Coralie, for uh, shining a spotlight on that one. Much appreciated. Um, oh. 
Just a comment because I sit on the resolutions committee for UBCM this year, so it better be different, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're on our side on this one, Councillor Rudenberg, so. Um, okay, so that's out of the way. So now we're going to uh, city staff reports, and this is admin report number 30 slash 23, Quinnell Volunteer Fire Department 2022 incident report, and I'm going to go to uh, Director Reichert for this report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so yeah, this is just a brief, brief overview of our 911 incident calls for 2022, and I will compare them to 2021 because 2021 was a significant increase also. Um, so in 2021, we had a total of a four, uh, 643 combined calls, and in 2022, we had an increase with a total of 724 calls. And this is the highest call volume ever recorded. Um, the increase in incidents that contributed these numbers were as follows. So I've taken the six top 10 incidents. Um, so basically burning complaints increased from 56 to 66 calls. Fire alarm calls, commercial buildings, we went from 45 to 71 in 2022. Uh, fire alarms residential, we went from 40 to 60 calls in 2022. Um, open air fires, we went from six to 14. Uh, structure fire calls, we went from 7 to 14 in 2022, and four of those calls happened in one day, and that was December 21st. Um, medical aid calls was our largest increase, and then we went from 128 to 194 in 2022. Um, so a significant increase there. Um, our average response times uh, within the city was seven minutes, three seconds. Um, an average response time in the district, and that the CRD is eight minutes flat. And that's for our first arriving uh, emergency fire department vehicle. And we had a combined average of seven minutes, 13 seconds. Um, on a positive note, we had a, a huge increase, well, not a huge increase, but a minor increase in minor and serious motor vehicle accidents in 2022. So we had a, we had a huge increase in 2021, but um, we did go down. Um, so at this time, I, any questions? Uh, thank you, Chief. Any uh, questions, Councillor Rudenberg? Thank you. Um, I know you guys are just always busy, busy, busy. Uh, your recruitment program, how's that going? It's good. We have uh, five new recruits, and we should be start uh, in another week. We'll be starting with those. Excellent. So. Um, so with the fires that you do have, after the fact, do you get reports on cause, fire cause? on fire cause. Well, we have to do any major incident where there's a dollar loss, we have to do a report on that and we have to do an investigation on that, so like a structure fire. So do you see any type of trends in the type of fires that you're responding to? Um, no, um, you know, we did see a significant increase in, in the province. We did also with lithium batteries mm -hmm. and we did see that increase. And in 2020, I believe it was, we did have two fires that, uh, you know, contributed to that. But um, um, there are a variety now of, of kind of the causes of them. Okay, and, and that's why I was asking, because mm -hmm. I know that there's been a real um, media piece on, especially electric batteries for um, mm -hmm. bikes and, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so I know at one point in time, we were having issues um, with the costing of equipment. And when I say equipment, I mean supplies that are used when you do your medical call outs. Mm -hmm. um, so can you refresh my memory how those costs are? Do we have to cover off costs of things like the oxygen tanks and materials or are they do they come from a separate uh, level of government so at the beginning of each year we what we do is we purchased um, the equipment that's needed to restock so you know if we had um, AED batteries that need to be uh, that are expired we will replace those any calls that we do go to where we use medical equipment we have a good rapport with our BC ambulance service here in Quinnell and they will actually um, replace that equipment for us you know, masks um, AED pads whatever the case may be Excellent. I was wondering if that was still mm -hmm. in place. Thank yeah, you. it definitely helps. Excellent. Okay, anyone else on this one? Uh, seeing none, uh, thank you, Chief, and um, good luck with the, um, the recruitment and the, and the, uh, the volunteers. Uh, we're behind you 100% on that one. Thank you. We, we, you know, we know that volunteerism is a, is a, a big item, so uh, yeah, huge um, item. we're going to be shining even more of a spotlight on on volunteer as we as we move forward. 
Okay, uh, then the next item is um, K2, and this is admin report 29 slash 23, 23, uh, 2023 to 2027 five year capital budget. Now I'm going to go to Director Bolton. Thank you. So this report is to bring forward the capital budget to Council for approval. So the Financial Sustainability and Audit Committee, they've reviewed the capital budget a couple times in detail and recommended it to Council. So the report shows capital spending in 2023 is estimated at $8.1 million. In the attachment, you can see all the projects that make up that $8.1 million. The capital budget is balanced in terms of revenue required for it. At this point, carry forwards from 2022 have not been included just because we haven't closed year end, so we don't know the numbers yet, but they will be put in there before the five year financial plan bylaws passed. The budget includes using long term debt for a fire engine that's needed in 2024. Um, due to how long it takes to get a fire engine, even though we don't need it till 2024, we will have to order it in 2023, which means passing all the required bylaws for debt this year. So that will be one of the recommendations for Council. The five-year capital budget is currently being built with increases in the capital reinvestment reserve starting in 2024. This was to try to balance the spending and income. So at this point, there is still a funding gap with the projects that come from the capital reinvestment reserve. Over the next year, we'll have to review where the funding is coming from and what we need to do. The biggest challenge is, of course, the Johnson Bridge project. We have it in 2024 and with a large chunk of it being funded from our reserves. So until we have a final knowledge of what's happening with that bridge and how it's being funded. We can't really look at that reserve, but once we know that, then we can take a hard look. So the re recommendations are that Council approves the 2023 capital projects to proceed and direct staff to move forward with building the five-year financial plan bylaw with the capital projects and funding sources proposed over the five years. And number two is that Council approves that the fire engine required in 2024 be purchased using long-term debt and direct staff to begin the process of creating a long-term borrowing bylaw and the reverse petition process for electrical, electoral approval of that loan. Uh, thank you, Director Bolton. Before we get into um, questions and comments, I'd like to get a motion on the floor relative to uh, recommendation number one to start off with. So I've got Councillor Elliott, no? Yes, Councillor Vic, now Councillor Elliott. Okay, and now I'm gonna open it up to um, questions, comments, etc. We're a quiet bunch tonight. Okay, so um, then, oh, I've got Councillor Runge. I knew that, I knew that you would come out of the woodwork there. Yeah, I just didn't want to be first. All right, so I have a, I, I, my apologies for not meeting that financial, uh, the FSEC meeting there that runs early on the Wednesdays when I'm often in class, so I can't attend. So I do have a few questions. I don't know which order to start in, so we should, uh, maybe we'll start going down the list and see what happens. Or maybe I'll go upwards, upwards from the list. And I know I, I pick on this every single time. I think it's every year. It's the uh, electric car for our administration, uh, our EV vehicle for 50000 which I think now is underpriced for a new EV vehicle anyway. Uh, when, when we say yes to this budget, are we looking, because we're looking at it as a five-year budget. So my question, I guess my question actually was, uh, <sighs> Like sometimes I feel that we put we put the capital and the operating budgets apart from each other, and is it? Uh, and then we approve one, and then sometimes have to come revisit something. If, like if numbers on the other one are way off, is there any way that we can look at this, approve it in principle, and then and, and is, is then, do we then afterwards approve it? Like like I guess it, just one question to budgeting, and then I want to go into some of the line items. I'm going to go to Director Bolton for an answer on that one. So the reason, we used to actually bring the operating budget first and then the capital budget, but then we switched because we found that if we could tender early in the year and get going earlier in the year, there was quite a bit of savings to be had in the capital budget. So that's the reason why we bring the capital budget first now. The only effect on the operating budget is that one line, the taxation from the capital budget on the funding page, the 130,000. The rest of the funding for the capital comes from reserves, grants, DCCs, et cetera. So there really isn't a large interplay between them. I guess then I'm just gonna go down a few of these lists and just ask some questions. Uh, so um, with regards to, uh, I guess I'm on page three of 15 of the budget document. Okay. 
so the upgraded uh, sidewalks, it's a fifteen thousand dollar amount for every year going forward. Is that is that a historical number, or do we or do we just allocate fifteen thousand just move it forward? And I guess sorry, that, yeah. Yeah, the crosswalk upgrades are, are upgrades we've been doing annually. Um, you, know, you know, like on Anderson Drive, there's been some pedestrian flashing crosswalks. So um, the cost on average is just under fifteen thousand dollars for those. Yes, yeah, so my understanding was it was to put one a new one in, but do we upgrade to that cost every year or is that a budget item that we're actually able to possibly lower? I guess ultimately those, those are my questions, right? Is there any way to, like if we have all the flashing sidewalks, crosswalks already set up, that maintenance in my mind, or maybe I need clarification, isn't, you know, I don't know, about 15,000 every year or are we putting new ones in every year? Yeah, the, we are putting new ones in. We have been putting new ones in traditionally the last number of years. So the, with the five-year budget being more fluid in the outer years, um, what we do have a, a crosswalk identified for 2023. So um, when we all, we've we been looking, we've had some demands and some looking at some crosswalks that are frequently traveled. We focus on, you know, near, near schools, et cetera, school bus routes, um, high, high traffic areas where people cross the road. And, and that, I guess that same thing would go for just sidewalk repairs too, that we just use the money that's allocated every year, this is the same, just moving that forward like crosswalks? That's been traditionally the case where we, we have, you know, small sections that aren't standalone very large capital projects, but capital projects such as sections of sidewalk, for example, 2022, you know, we upgraded the sidewalk in front of the senior centre, so that's where those miscellaneous areas. So when we get to our annual sidewalk inspections, these are the short sections we identified as standalone sidewalk capital projects. Perfect, thank you. And then uh, going with the crosswalks, the Memorial Park just... It's just a line item for me. I, you know, can I just get a little clarification on that? Yeah, so that's the um, um, honorarium park right um, on a um, Abbott Drive. Um, just across from the Mac store. So the park there, the the old existing pavers of all the walkway, they've, they've deteriorated and they're not becoming unsafe. So it's to replace all the pathways in that park. Perfect. Uh, yeah, perfect. I was just, I was, I'm not, in my mind, I was hoping, well, is there some sort of, sort of possibility for some sort of grant to remove, to help us out with that? That's where, you know, some sort of green belt funding or something like that. That's what I was thinking. All right. You know, I, you know, I don't mind coming back to, to, to my, you know, I've got a lot of little questions here. Miss Lean, the side dogs we talked about. The, um, with regards to furnaces and things, this does, I think this goes to public, well, I guess it's public works too. Some of the, Nope, I'm sorry. I was talking about furnaces and wondering if we get funding for that. On the landfill compactor, uh, page 7 of 15. And I'm not sure who this question goes to. To you? Uh, so when we purchase a new one, which is required, uh, because this is about a million dollar piece of equipment, where do we see the resale of our old one as a council? Like, you know, so... That's a good point, Nancy. Council, we could bring it to the FSAC so they see it. So what happens is it goes back into our equipment reserve. So every time we do a trade in and we receive however much money, it goes back into the equipment reserve to pay for the new equipment. And just for reference, the CRD does pay for 34% of the landfill con contractors, so the whole cost isn't to us. Yeah, I was just wondering if, if that's in that number or if this is the leftover portion of everything that isn't covered. So we estimate, let's say, the re, uh, that we, tra you know, when we buy a new one that we get a trade-in of, let's say, 200K, so, and then they pay 30%, so that would put that compact right at 1.5 million or something? No, the 900,000 is the total value, so that includes our share and their share. And I just show it on the funding page as funding coming from the CRD. Thank you, that's, that's wonderful. You know what? And on my final question, my final one is that 95,000 for admin. If I could have that broken down again, as I, I believe I do almost every year. For okay, thank you, Councillor. Got a question about the 95,000? Oh, we're not done. No, not done. What 95 are we? I, uh, the, it, I believe it was for the administration line, and it was on, on line item. It was on page. Oh, you got to go to page 13 for the detail. Oh, thank you. Uh, that electric vehicle, is that where the, the one falls in or is it one of these that always pops up in my head? For That's that? the same page as the electric vehicle that we have at this moment in 2024, but of course we'll reassess last year, next year, sorry, whether or not we'll proceed. Thank you. I can go now. 
<laughs> okay, thank you. I just want to put in a, uh, no, before I do that, is, is there anything else from council members? I just want to say kudos for staff, to staff for picking up on my suggestion that we look at um, widening, particularly for pedestrians, Westland Road, it's good to see that in there. And also, and I know it's down the road a ways, but also a rebuild of um, Lewis Drive, and that was perpetrated mainly by a couple of letters that came in uh, from the Avaline Place um, uh, Strata Corporation uh, requesting that there be improved um, sidewalk uh, to serve Avaline, but I know that we're gonna go beyond that up to Bobian, so, so thank you for putting that in there. Anything more on this item before we move on? Okay, then the next one is um, admin report 31 slash 23. Oh, I guess we gotta have a motion, don't we? A motion on, and I, I do have a mover and a seconder, right? So now I'm gonna call the question, thank you for that. Uh, call the question, all in favor? Opposed? Carried, thank you. So now we will move to the next uh, report, and that is um, report number uh, 31 slash 23. Point of order, uh, Mayor, there's a second resolution there. Okay, so the second resolution is regarding the, um, the fire engine. And uh, I would like to get a mover on that one. Uh, moves Councillor uh, Rudenberg, second Councillor uh, McKelvey. Any discussion on that one? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you for bringing, I'm just trying to hurry, I guess. Okay, now I'm going to go to uh, report number 3123, Development Permit Variance 228 Gas Off Road, Director Turner. Thank you, Mayor. And as you heard earlier tonight through the public hearing, this was addressed. Uh, um, um, it, this is a subject of that same uh, development application. Uh, this uh, variance was uh, also noted in the first readings and was uh, clarified. The applicate this that this variance uh, resolution would need to come forth at this meeting tonight. Um, the applicant has applied to vary the minimum lot size of the mobile home park um, uh, from uh, to allow it to be one. 1.57 hectares. The lot uh, does not currently meet the minimum lot size even currently um, and is considered legally non-conforming. Staff, however, does recommend approving the development variance permit. This uh, this uh, mobile home park, as you're all aware, is a long-standing mobile home park that was developed even prior to being in the city. Um, and staff sees no issues with it, um, serviced by both city water and city sewer. The recommendation is that council vary the minimum lot size to 1.57 hectares on lot one, district lot 3948, Caribou district plan 12692, and lot two, district lot 3948, Caribou district plan 12692. Okay, thank you for that. So do we require a resolution as per the recommendation or do we wait until the um, it comes up in bylaws? We need a resolution pursuant to the recommendation that council vary the minimum lot size, et cetera, et cetera. So now I'm looking for a mover on that one. Councillor Vic, Councillor Elliott, uh, any discussion? Yes, yes Councillor Runge. So I guess my question is to, uh, to our fine director. Uh, just my uh, a quick question. Uh, will us, uh, if we, if we were to support this recommendation, would this cause any uh, future issues to any other mobile home parks that may, yeah, okay, that may or may not be? I think you know a variance is individual to the variance that's uh, requested. It, it has no impact on being a precedent or anything like that, et cetera. Okay, thank you. I'm ready to call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. And we'll be dealing with the actual bylaws further down the road. So now we're going to go to uh, admin report 3223 clean team program and I'm going to go to Director Turner for this report. Thank you, Mayor. 
This uh, report is to provide an update on the clean team programs in Quinell and seek direction on expanding peer hours. As I've noted in this report, um, clean teams have been running in the community for many years, um, up to 2017. The majority of uh, this has been um, applied for uh, and uh, funded and operated by the Quinell Shelter and Support Services uh, Society. Um, these teams are utilized to pick up needles and other drug use paraphernalia, um, as well as those teams have done other issue, uh, programs under, the, under that uh, organization. Um, however, unfortunately, uh, these teams, um, the Quinell Shelter and Support Society team uh, is no longer receiving funding. Um, and uh, as you're aware, we also have had some funding for through a city program um, uh, that uh, occurred in 2021. Uh, we did receive some extensions to that. However, it is a bit reduced. So definitely the clean team funding um, is, is being um, decreased in the community. And there is going to be a result of less peer hours and likely some issues um, when I talk with the operator or the coordinator for the city. Uh, there has been some complaints already about the reduced services and seeing uh, additional uh, um, uh, paraphernalia around the community. Um, I've provided um, a bit more uh, description of in terms of the exact amount uh, that is um, sort of being requested by the uh, sh uh, the coordinator who said, you know, what would it take to at least get things improved and to cover some of the areas um, that have been uh, traditionally covered by that Quinell Shelter and Support Team, especially the key areas, such as Riverview School and some of those West Quinell areas that um, were primarily um, um, cleaned by those teams. Um, and as you'll see in the financial um, 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 uh, implications, uh, the, uh, the expectation is about $480 per week would be required to make, make that exact extra uh, clean, uh, those clean team um, contributions, um, which in total would be $12,480. That is up into the, ex the extent of our program, which will be ending in July 31st. So this uh, report has two uh, um, um, uh, points to it. One is uh, at requesting if we want to keep up that additional uh, clean team hours, but also a bit of a flag that we are going to be seeing those programs ending in, in um, July unless the province, as they did last time, comes up with some additional funding um, for these programs. Okay, so thank you. Would you, like me to, would you like to discuss it or yeah. before we go to the, thanks? So uh, the recommendation is that council direct staff to, or direct staff to direct additional funding, et cetera. And that, that would be uh, tied in with the financial implications as well. Like if you're looking for a number to incorporate into that resolution, that's where the number is in financial implications. Am I right? Thank you. If, if we want to extend uh, and we want to increase the clean team peers, that's the number that I've, I've added. Well, I guess what I'm looking for then is some direction from council as to how far we want to go with that. Uh, so, um, Councillor Vick. I'll, I'll make a motion that, just just so we can discuss it, I'll make a motion that we top up, essentially it's a top up we're looking for, right, Director Turner? It, that's exactly okay. right. So the a top up of $12,480 to tie it is over till July 31st for clean team operations. That would be my motion. You're moving that? I'll move that, yeah. Okay. You're moving that and Councillor uh, Tony Goulet, you're seconding it, okay. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Vick. Thank you. Um, Director Turner, so historically the QSSS has provided that baseline clean team operation for the last five years, many years. Are they no longer um, pursuing the program because the grant funding they used to receive has run out or are they just not applying for it anymore? Thank you, and, and I gotta say, this has been a consistent thing over the last several years where we've never been quite sure, and they've a little bit been like we are, so I, I, I can sympathize, where the grant funding wasn't available and they were told it wasn't available and suddenly somebody would give them additional funding and they would run to the to the, to the the uh, table and grab the dollars. Uh, my understanding from what they've told me is it's not um, it's not uh, available, that particular grant funding for sure, um, and they in, in there just don't have the resources to do uh, the additional grant funding research. And uh, and likely the uh, the uh, um, the management of it as well. I guess I, I thank you. 
Um, so I will just make a comment f for council is, um, and I'm sure other councillors can also reflect on the work that the clean team does for our community and it is invaluable. And um, should we ever find ourselves in a, in a position where there is not a clean team, we would hear about it immediately, immediately, about the dangers to our children, to, uh, to our citizens uh, encountering this paraphernalia. Um, I am concerned about a $12,000 implication to our operating budget for next year. I guess this, this would be a supplemental, Dr. Bolton. Mm -hmm. I was going to actually stick my hand and ask for clarification. So there's some options whether we add this to budget 2023 as a supplemental would be one or we take it from council initiatives. So it's another area that council could consider. Go I'm ahead, Councillor Vic. I'm not sure I would look for yeah. some feedback on that. Um, I guess I'll just finish my thought. My thought would be um, we need to, uh, this may give us some time to our, our, our formulate a plan on the clean team permanently um, because it, it, this 12,000 is really a very small amount in terms of the overall funding for the clean team. This is just to prop it up and keep it running um, uh, in an enhanced form. Um, and I really honestly think we should be talking to our partners at Northern Health and others about participation in this expense as in many cases it's those organizations that are distributing the needles um, for um, individuals to use which end up in our parks in our on our streets so we really need to have some conversations with our partners in the community on funding this operation um, and that's my thought okay thank you uh, so we do have a motion on the floor for the um, for the 12,000 and change but is is staff or yeah is staff looking for council direction as to how that's going to get funded? I did hear council initiatives. That's where I would. So we have a point of order, I believe. We're still in discussions, aren't we, of, of what, what's going on before we get to the numbers? Or are we are we throwing numbers on the table first? Well, we're, I'm trying to make sure that a number is attached to the resolution. My resolution had a number, Mayor. Yeah. Well, that's where I'm going, but we. We didn't clarify the source of where that funding was going to come from, and I'm trying to get that settled down. So would you be okay with including that in your resolution, Councillor Vic, that, uh, that, the, that the funding come from a council initiatives? Once again, it's a point of order. If we look at the recommendation, my apologies, Mr. Mayor, but it says council direct staff to direct additional funding, which would then say where it's coming from to the existing clean team. So I think that's already in the recommendation. Uh, with all due respect, no. So I would be amenable to it coming from council initiatives. Okay, thank you. And seconder, you're okay with that? Okay, we, we're, we're getting some traction now. So is there any further discussion on this before we change our mind? Councillor Runge. Well, it's not about changing our mind. It's just about being clear about things. Thank you. Um, I absolutely concur with, uh, uh, with Councillor Vic with regards to this being an extremely, extremely important function. I really do believe it should be other, for, uh, other uh, senior government places that continue to fund this. My question, I guess, though, comes to, because this is really just a Band-Aid over a solution that we actually might be getting ourselves into a quagmire, and it, it opens up a can of worms, possibly with our HR department and contract with our staff if we start to fund different types of things. Like, So we're just adding to the funding now for what reason? So Because they already have a, they have an amount that will take them from now till July. Thank you. They do have an amount that will take them from now till the end of July, but that's for the what the clean team hours are right now that won't cover these areas that were over, that were used to be covered by the Quinnell Shelter and Support Society. So yeah, it will take away, you know, we had two te we had two different teams running in Quinnell and they and they broke up different areas and they concentrated on different areas and, and locations and um, um, and this this will not uh, this will not cover some key that currently our team does not cover some of those key areas. Uh, yeah, okay. I get, sorry, I just, need, I just need clarification with our team. So our team is a city team that we're already paying for right now, or the... 
Pinellas Shelter and Support, uh, or sorry, the, the, the clean team that we have that I call, I'm calling the city team is supported by grant funding out of the community services grant. Um, and uh, we've had that for the two years now. And uh, yes, that's the, that's the team I'm talking about that we utilize. The dollars, the top up dollars are just for stipends. So it's not an HR issue. We, we do not, we do not employ individuals. Um, we, we provide stipends for cleanup. All right, so then just as another option to council, because the clean team is extremely important and it's extremely important to all our BIAs. C could this amount not be taken out of the three BIAs? Uh, like, do they have fun? And you know, we have two of the BIAs here. I'm not, you know, the question is, should it be our council initiatives or, or is this, could this be a role of our BIA also? That's a, that's a tough question because if that's out of their budget, then they would have to be asked about that. Councillor Vick, and oh, I'm going to go to Councillor Rudenberg first. Thank you. Um, so one of the one of the um, comments you made was about uh, whether this interferes with our our union workers at the city level. My understanding is most of this work is done on private property. So when we talk about behind businesses, you know, the West Park Mall area, um, it's not so much the city owned land. Even though you know, if they're walking across the park and they see a needle lying there, they're not going to not pick it up. Um, but my understanding is that the majority of their work is more on the private property side of things. So I don't think there's a conflict. And uh, I mean, I know that maybe uh, Director Turner can correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. And, I, and where, where this, where, the, where it ends up is that no, there, it's, there is some private, probably very less private than public. It's more public type areas. Um, but it is sort of calls and direct cleaning of needles that does, isn't covered currently by, by our, our union. We've had the conversation with our union and they are, they are aware that this is not, this is not a service covered by our our current activities. Thank you. I have Councillor Vic next. Yeah, uh, Councillor Runge, you, you brings up an, an excellent point about BIAs par participating in some fashion, because in large part, a, a lot of the activity of the clean team affects the downtown core and, and core of West Quinell, which enhances the BIA and is is good for business. Um, however, in terms of this dollar amount today, uh, it would be almost impossible to ask the BIAs to consider that as their budget cycles are already all the way through. So to my earlier point that we really need to find some sustainable funding for a clean team will probably involve discussions with BIAs in the future um, and senior levels of government because this is a health expense. In fact, um, I would encourage, you're the mover, uh, Councillor Vic, to uh, incorporate the word in interim into that motion so that it's clear that uh, this is not a permanent fix, but this is, uh, you know, a temporary fix until uh, we can find uh, sustainable funding. Would that be fair? I'm amenable to all that, yep. And we're good with the seconder? Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. And I think, uh, if I'm understanding this, we already have that embedded in the in the financial implications because it runs out on July 31st. Is that not our timeline? So do we need to do we need to say that it's only interim when it's going to run out? Is that correct? It's going to run out in July. That is 100% correct. Yes. Yeah, so I don't need to know. We, we need to do that. I think we have a timeline already that's in, embedded within that. Thank you. I, I, I was just trying to get a reference in there, in there to the notion that this is not permanent, but um, it, it's at Council's pleasure. I'm going to go to Councillor um, Elliott. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a ditto, I think, to the councillor uh, comments that we've got taking place here. I'm I'm amenable with the the top up for sure, but I think we have to have the the wraparound discussions with Northern Health, senior government, BIAs, everybody involved, because I think we've invested a a lot in the safety of the city. We've we've upped the the bylaw contingent. We've upped RCMP, and this is just another aspect. And to Councillor Vic's point. Uh, if we didn't top it up and it stopped in July, we would hear about it the next day, I believe. So, yeah, we have to figure out how we're going to fund it um, long term. But I think council initiatives is a place to go at, at this point in time. Uh, thank you, Councillor Elliott. Do I have any more discussion before I call the question? Okay, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. 
Okay, if that I can, can, Mr. Mayor. And I heard, if I can, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. I just want to say I heard some discussion around is there a, another motion coming out of there that we look at a, a, a plan with the other partners involved? Like, do we need to give direction that we start beginning that process now? July is not very far away, but should we begin a process to try and, and look at that? I don't know how that words into a motion, but I'm just thinking that we give direction that we're, we want to look at. Well, that sounds long-term like funding, right? So that or sustain like our perfect, however we want to. Yeah, it. that sounds like a perfectly good motion. We'll see if you get a seconder, Councillor or Councillor McKelvey. Any discussion on that one? Are you clear on that, uh, Ria? Okay, thank you. No, no further. Go, oh, Councillor Elliott. Yeah, I don't mind the motion at all. I'll vote in favor of it. But it's it could be something that we talk about at uh, strategic planning briefly. Thank you, good point. Okay, calling question on the motion. All in favor, opposed, carried. Uh, next item is the council information package and I will draw council's attention to their, there's two items on there regarding the North Central Local Government Association. One is their strategic plan stretching out to 2026 and also their resolutions deadline is coming up very soon. And also uh, with regard to the letter from Canadian Federation of Independent Business, I'm digging into that to, to find out uh, on um, how, how we're going to meet. I'm, I'm not really clear on, on what they would like to talk to us about, so I'm following up on that one. Anything further? No, no questions coming out of uh, the SIP package. Uh, we don't have any correspondence. Now we're going to go to bylaws, and the next uh, or the first one is bylaw number 1930, City of Quesnel Zoning Bylaw Amendment Bylaw 1930 of 2022, and this is for the Easy Vape Shop at 960 Chu Road, and we're looking for final adoption mover. Moved by Councillor Vick, seconded by Councillor Rudenberg. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next one is bylaw number 1930, or yeah, 1931, official community plan uh, amendment bylaw, and this is regarding the um, the PRT growing services at 275 Lear Road. Final adoption, Councillor Elliott, Councillor. Uh, I'm sure that that wasn't a scratch. That was a that was a second. Was a that was a second. Legitimate. Okay, Councillor uh, McKelvey, Councillor Runge. Can I just have a question? So you were referring to this was bylaw. Uh, 1879, that's the one we were referring to just now? No, we're on 1931, right at the bottom of the page. Well, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the same page that you do, but it's item N2. Sorry, I got an old. <laughs> okay, no further discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Now we go to uh, bylaw number 1920 or 1932, and this is the same piece of property, the Growing Services Project at 27 Lear Road. This is the zoning bylaw, final adoption, mover, uh, Councillor Elliott, Councillor Runge, uh, any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. And then we have two light items, City of Quesnel Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw Number 2023, and this is Gassoff Road relative to the public hearing that was held earlier this evening. Mover, and this is for third reading. Uh, Councillor McKelvey, Councillor Rudenberg, any discussion? All in favor, opposed, carried. And the accompanying uh, zoning bylaw with respect to 20, 20, or 2288 Gas Off Road. We're going for third mover, uh, Councillor uh, Tony Goulet and Councillor Runge. Any discussion? All in favor, carried. Okay, we have. Um, as far as I can see, no changes to upcoming meeting schedule, no changes to committee appointments, announcements and future events, anyone? Don't forget to buy your dog sled mail run envelopes. There's my plug for the night. Um, gallery questions. Do we have any questions from the gallery? Any comments? No? Okay. Well then, hearing not... Oh, 
is sitting way in the back. Yes, come on up. Come up to the microphone and um, hit the... Yeah. Well, I, kn I know who you are, Steve, but uh, you you've got to identify yourself and say where you live and the way you go. And it has to pertain to something on the agenda. Oh, that's what that is. Okay. Uh, Steve Smith, I'm a realtor with North Kerry Realty and I drive school bus too. Um, it's just something that happened a couple of weeks ago that uh, upset my granddaughter. And I'd just like to ask why the tree was cut down outside the Legion. As I said, Steve, uh, it ha your question has to be relative to what's okay. on the agenda. That's what I wasn't sure about. I'm sorry. And and um, just very quickly, it, w it was a mature tree that that maybe could have been saved by pruning, but um, it's done. And I think that we're going to be paying a little closer attention because I saw the flare up on um, on Facebook on that one. Oh, Councillor, <laughs> City Manager. Thank you. As long as we're going to weigh in on that, the city does employ a certified tree safety specialist who also is in possession of a Bachelor of Science in Forestry. This person reviewed that tree and said it, what, there was risk to the public from falling branches at various times. There had been that tree at the bottom had been barricaded off, so to keep protect the public from falling branches. That tree location is in an area where it's a fairly high traffic foot area, relatively close to the crosswalk on that street, relatively cro close to the to the Legion and relatively close to the senior center. So high traffic area, danger tree. When the tree was cut up and removed, it was noted that there was rot in the tree. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. City Manager, and thank you, Steve. Great. Okay, seeing no more, oh, you got one more. Okay, you got a free one here. In regards to that, does uh, the city of Cornell have a tree replacement bylaw like most other cities and municipalities where one, if a tree is taken down for that certain, that it's replaced? No different from, um, say, Icon or any developer when they take, when they're building. Do we have anything like that? Uh, with the discretion of the mayor, we are actually ha have that coming forward to a PABCOM meeting, which is our policy and bylaw. The tree bylaw is will be shortly in front of that committee. So, and that will be one of the items that will be talked about of that replacement policy. I will forward that to my granddaughter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Hey, you bet. Okay, nothing further then. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. That's uh, Councillor Vick and Councillor McKelvey. We're not gonna have any discussion on that. We're just gonna vote on it all in favor. Thank you, everyone.